All right, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome everyone to our weekly session. Isa, uh, our, our volunteer Isa, I'm just going to request him to confirm that we are live on Facebook, just so uh, we can ensure that uh, we're able to continue. In the meanwhile, let me ask the rest of you whether you had the opportunity to take a look at the video I had shared last week, which was about the Qiraat and the, um, and the Ahruf. Uh, how many of you got a chance to take a look at that? If you did, just type in a yes in the chat window. Okay, thank you very much, Isa. Okay, so if you did, if you got a chance to look at that brief video, 10 minutes I think it was, um, on the Qiraat and Ahruf, just type in a yes in the chat window. Okay, so I'm assuming that uh, either you didn't get a chance yet or those who did get a chance have not joined us yet. Either way, uh, I do strongly encourage you guys to do that. Uh, in the meanwhile, let us uh, do a quick review of Surah Al-Infitar. That's the surah that we did last week. So that surah, just like Surah Al-Taqweer, was about the apocalypse. And it was talking about, it, it was a description of the Day of Judgment. And there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about anyone who wants to know what the day of judgment will look like, what will things look like, what will what will the environment be like, they should go through Surah Al-Taqweer, Surah Al-Infitar, that's the one we did last week, and Surah Al-Inshiqaq, which is, I think, the one that we're supposed to do next week. Um, the other thing that we looked at was every person uh, on that day will be given full knowledge of everything that they had done and uh, whatever they had in this world and whatever deeds they had sent forth to that day. Uh, the, another point that was made in that surah was that we are like those slaves who uh, think that their master won't care if they disobey the master. And that's something we have to be careful about. And uh, those who deny the accountability of the hereafter tend to have a certain psychology. Uh, it's, it's the psychology of a cop-out. They don't want to think about accountability. And, and shirk or associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a way to absolve ourselves of the responsibility of the actions that we do. And then, of course, there was the homework at the end. Now, let's move on to the surah that we're supposed to do today, which is Surah Al-Mutaffifin. Now, this surah actually is about human psychology. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created us, knows our psychology the best. So, um, before I go into the surah, I just want to give you a visual breakdown of the kinds of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about throughout the Qur'an. And specifically, the two or three types of people that will be emphasized or mentioned in this uh, surah. So this is a quick breakdown in, in the form of a little tree. The highest priority for people is something important for all of us to think about. What is the highest priority for me at this time? And what is the highest, highest priority for you at another time? The highest priority is what determines the kinds of actions that we do and the kinds of choices that we make especially when we have to choose between what is good and what is not so good. So even though we consider many things important to us, even though we desire many things, what is the highest priority will determine the choices that we make. So if we divide people up into two buckets, people who are believers and people who are disbelievers, the disbelievers that are talked about in the Quran, there's some for whom the highest priority is wealth. That's it. What matters to them is, is money more than anything else in the world. Sure, they care about their family to some extent. Sure, they might care about their neighbors to some extent, their friends to some extent. But really, push comes to shove. If they have to make a choice, for this group of people, wealth will be the most important. Then there's another group of people um, who are talked about in the Quran, which is people who, for whom their, their next generation is the most important. Their, the well-being of the next generation is the most important. Again, I'm still in the category of disbelievers. Then there's the third category, which is, uh, which is the category of disbelievers who are more noble. So their nobility extends to them caring about the society, uh, them caring about animals, uh, them caring about their nation, them caring about their country. So that is a form of nobility. Now, again, I'm talking about disbelievers. Now move on to the right, believers. Among the believers, also there are two categories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. There are those... On the left-hand side, you see, under the believers category, people for whom the happiness of this world is the most important. That is 
the highest priority. Sure, they believe in Allah Taala. They believe in the Day of Judgment, or at least verbally they say that they do. But when they have to make choices on a daily basis, the most important thing for them that determines their their chosen action, their choice is the happiness of this world. They want to be happy now. And then the 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 final category is those believers for whom, sure, they care about this world as well, but the highest priority for them is the happiness of the hereafter. And at the very bottom, you see this arrow, which is the increasing order of connection that someone has with their creator. These are the different types of people that are talked about in the Quran. Now, among these people, the the surah, Surah Al-Mutafifin, talks about those who make their choices such that they end up cheating other people. So let's go through this and understand how this might apply to us. A'udhu billahi min ishtan wa rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Waylun lil mutafifin, woe to the, the word here is defrauders in English, which is fair. Uh, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this word himself. Alladheena, إِذَا كْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ Those who almost forcefully seek full measure from other people. Uh, it's almost like they stand next to the person to make sure, you know, whatever they're getting, they're getting whatever is due to them. And that's fine. وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ But when they have to give someone else something, it could be the labor that they do, uh, it could be the time that they spend at work, it could be a product in a certain amount that they have to give to someone else, whatever they have to give to other people, they will give a little bit less than what they're supposed to. Dandi marna, so to speak. So the comparison here is that when they have to get something from someone else, their expectation is that they will be given their fair share. But when they have to give something to someone else, they're not giving that person what is fairly due to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing out here that it is human instinct that we recognize what is fair and what is not. It's, it's almost like we go into a situation and we mutually recognize without saying something out loud that whatever has been agreed on, whatever is the expected amount, that has to be given. If not, it will be considered injustice. This is, part, this is a part of human societies, whether they're Muslim or not. All people all around the world recognize this. So it's almost like a human instinct. But these people that are being talked about here, mutaffifin, these people are those defrauders who overcome that human instinct in their own interest. When they have to get something from someone, they do insist on getting their fair share. But when they have to give something to someone else, wealth is so important to them, they're so ignoble, their wealth is so important to them that they will overcome that instinct and give less than what is due to other people. And then Allah Taala continues, Do such people not think that they will be resurrected? These words are very important because frankly, no law in the world can ensure that people will not cheat. The most just societies that we talk about frequently in our drawing room conversations, the most just societies still have injustice where the law may not be able to reach or you may not be able to... Um, provide evidence for the fraud. People still get away with things. No law in the world can do that. The only thing that can ensure that people will not cheat other people is their own intrinsic inside motivation, which comes from a sense of accountability, that I will be judged on a certain day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold me accountable for my actions. And here Allah is saying, Allah yadunnu ulaika annahum It's almost like a threat. Do such people not think that they will be resurrected, that they will be brought back, that they will be held to account? The day all people will stand before the Lord of all worlds. And we've just spent the past few surahs talking about that day of judgment. All the way from the beginning of the 30th juz, from uh, Surah An-Naba, all the way to Surah Al-Infitar, the one that we did last week. It's all description of that day. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has moved into Surah Al-Muttafifin. Okay, so that is that day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about. Now here are the actions that are supposed to be shaped by belief. Shaped by what we know to be absolutely true. One important point to make here before I continue is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Rum, that whatever 
difficulties befall people in this world as well. Of course, in the hereafter, we'll have to pay for everything. But even in this world, when societies are destroyed, it happens because of the choices that people make. So in many ahadith, the Prophet has mentioned that when there's a lot of fraud, that will bring disasters to that society. Uh, the, the, in Surah Al-Rum, Allah SWT says, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيد الناس that um, uh, the, the, the uh, destruction has spread in the land and in the seas uh, with because of what the what people have with their own hands earned. We have to be careful that the actions that we take have an effect on the society around us as well. This is the law of Allah SWT. And then Allah continues, okay, on that day, what will happen? Uh, how will these people be held to account? And may Allah SWT not make us among them. I mean, kalla. But no. In the kitab al-fujari lafi sijin. The wicked. Uh, the word here is uh, wicked in English, but in, in Arabic, the word fujar, fajar, is like the, the one who kind of tears, like tears what is right. The wicked are certainly bound for sijin in the depths of hell. And what will make you understand what sijin is? Meaning, you really can't understand. And then, Allah SWT continues, Kitabu Marqum. This uh, phrase, Kitabu Marqum, can mean that it is a, a record, and it can also mean that it is a fate already sealed, the way that the translator translated it here. One important question that I have for you is, what, do, I mean, what, sense does it make for a record to be sealed? We're talking about a record here, Kitabu Marqum. What sense does it make for a record to be sealed? I mean, it's people who did the bad deeds, right? Does it make sense that their records would be sealed? That's one explanation of this verse. Record to be sealed. I Go ahead and, and type in your response in the chat window and there's no right or wrong answer. We're just trying to understand the, the most superficial layer of the Quran just by reading it. So what do you think that means? That we will have our records of bad deeds and good deeds, and those records will be in certain places. Right now we're talking about records of bad deeds being sealed in a place which is um, in the depths of hell. What sense does it make for records to be sealed? Think about that. And um, uh, in the meanwhile, I'll continue. If somebody, somebody comes up with a response, you know, use your own minds. Uh, somebody comes up with a response, then inshallah. Okay, so uh, too late for change. Hearts are stamped. Okay, so what our sister said, okay, think about that for a moment. Hearts are stamped. Um, that that relates to what one of the explanations is. Magnitude of evil that can't be changed. Okay, um, uh, no more chance for any dead, so nobody can change them. Sure. So what, what is being, what, what's happening here is that some of the Mufassirin have the opinion that the soul inside of us serves as the record. All the good deeds and the bad deeds that we do, our soul is the record. It is on our soul that those good deeds and bad deeds are kind of stamped. And like our sister said, our hearts are also stamped. Uh, so means it will be revealed on the Day of Judgment. Sure, it will be revealed on the Day of Judgment. Yep. Uh, nobody ca can see them. Perhaps we're talking about the same thing. But I hope you guys got the point that I was trying to make. That one explanation is that our souls in the depths of hell, they will be the they will have the record. Woe on that day to the deniers. Now, this word deniers, this is important. Deniers of what? Many of these people do not deny God. Many of these people can actually be. I'm going to say something, but I'm kind of scared of saying it. Uh, sometimes these people may verbally declare themselves to be Muslim. Uh, and I'm saying that just as a reminder for us, because we don't want to be among those people. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make any Muslim among those people. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save even the non-Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save them by, by, by giving them the tawfiq to accept belief. But it's important that we understand this word denial. Deniers of what? These are not necessarily deniers of God. These are deniers of what will happen on the Day of Judgment. These are people whose actions show that they're not really... Rec yes, that's right. So, as I said, they're deniers of the Day of Judgment. 
يُكَذِّبُونَ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينِ These are the ones who deny the judgment day. وَمَا يُكَذِّبُ بِهِ إِلَّا كُلُّ مُعْتَدٍ أَثِيمٍ None will deny it except every evil-doing transgressor. I don't have a lot of time. Otherwise, these words, مُعْتَد and أَثِيمٍ, these words have a lot of depth. So when you start peeling off the layers, the Qur'an has beautiful jewels that you can just pick up and, and, and wonder over. Right now, we're short in time, so let's go with the translation that we have. Uh, uh, meaning you have to be really evil and you have to really go beyond bounds to reject the reality of that day of judgment for several reasons that we've been discussing for the past few weeks. Uh, whenever our revelations are recited to them, they say, Ancient fables, stories of old. But no, in fact, their hearts have been stained by the evil they used to commit. In English, by the way, this is really nice, um, the, the way the, the translator has written it. In Arabic, the word rana means to have rust come over something. And what our sister had said a, a few moments ago about the hearts being stamped, that's actually from a hadith of the Prophet uh, The stamping of the heart happens as the final outcome. But in the beginning, what happens is whenever the Prophet said that whenever one of us does something bad, uh, a, a little stain shows up on the heart. And then when we seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa that stain is removed. But if we don't seek forgiveness and then we continue to do bad deeds, then more and more and more spots show up on the heart. And we're talking about the spiritual heart here, of course. And eventually the Prophet said the heart is then sealed. And the heart is like a sister said, stamped. And when khatam Allahu ala qulubihim, as in the Quran, uh, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stamps their heart because this person, no, no coming back for them, as, as some of our brothers were saying a moment ago. So those are the people that we're talking about here. Uh, their hearts have been stained by all the evil they used to commit. Now, we're talking about the Day of Judgment. And on the Day of Judgment, uh, uh, undoubtedly, they will be sealed off from their Lord on that day. Now, sealed off from the Lord, what does that mean? Uh, can anyone think of a reason why? And we're not talking about paradise when believers will regularly get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're talking about the Day of Judgment. Paradise has not, I mean, that has not happened yet. This is still the Day of Judgment. On the Day of Judgment, these people will be hidden from their, um, from their Lord. So, what does that mean to be hidden from their Lord? Go ahead, think about it and, and share with me uh, your... Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not talk to them. All right. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, out of mercy. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, no doubt. Um, actually, there are uh, uh, other ayat in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that on that day, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will in some form reveal his presence. And those who used to make sujood in this world, they will be able to find comfort in the presence of their Lord. Whether or not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal himself, uh, I mean, how that will happen, we don't know. But we know, like, yukshafu an saqin. This is a verse mentioned in the Quran. Um, and, and certainly they will not be able to receive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Sure. So, the, the hijab means that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does reveal himself uh, to give comfort to the believers in whatever form Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, they will not be able to receive that, which means the day of judgment will become harder for them. More, uh, uh, moreover, they will surely burn in hell. And then they will be told, this is what you used to deny. Now, out of all of these things that are mentioned, this is not even the fire of hell that has started yet. Even from before that, their difficulties will start almost from the point at which they die. So you might recall uh, last week we talked about how when a person dies, the soul is told at the very beginning. Uh, you know, yeah, that's one possibility. And the other possibility is, oh, you really evil soul. So you almost know where you're going to end up. But then every stage that one goes through, um, including the Day of Judgment, the different stages of the Day of Judgment, things become more and more difficult until the person ends up in the fire of hell. That is the 
magnitude of the kind of choices that people are making. Now, I had said, I had talked about the denial, right? Now, there are three levels of denial that I would just want to mention really quickly. And these are mentioned in various verses in the Quran. These are three levels of denying the reality of the afterlife. What you see at the very bottom is people who are certain. They just say it with certainty that there is no life after this one. This is in Surah Al-Jathiyah. Uh, all we have is just the life of this world. That's it. After this, we'll just die and you know become dust and nothing. Then the second level is when there is some doubt about whether there is an afterlife or not. Sure, I believe in God. Sure, yeah, yeah, I can. I see that there is no justice in this world, so there's got to be an afterlife. But you know, but I'm not really sure what it's going to be like, or maybe, maybe not. So this is mentioned again in Surah Al-Jathiyah. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ إِنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٌّ وَالسَّاعَةِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا قُلْتُمْ مَا نَدْرِي مَا السَّاعَةِ إِنَّ ظُنُّ إِلَّا ظَنَّ وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُسْتَيْقِنِينَ that, um, yeah, we're not kind of sure of this. And, uh, you know, yeah, we kind of think it's like that, but we're not mustaqini. We're not really certain of it. So it's not something we want to think about. That's the second level. Then there's a the third level. And the third level is where, yeah, you know, and you recognize that there is an afterlife, but you think that you will have some special treatment on that day. This is also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah SWT says, and they say that the fire will not touch us except for a few days. Of course, the people talk about here is from Bani Israel, but it applies directly to Muslims as well. Uh, so if a Muslim, for example, says, oh, we are from Umat Muhammad, so obviously we'll have some special treatment or, um, you know, to the extent of saying that, uh, or because there was a certain saint that I was following, so because of that, I'll have a special treatment. Or saying something like, in this world, Allah has given me a lot, so obviously I am favored. Uh, and that means that in the afterlife, also I'll be well taken care of. All of these are different levels of thinking that, yeah, I may be punished, but you know, not for very long. That's the third level. And all three involve denial. Really, they involve denial of the Day of Judgment and being held to account. And all three guide the action that is being talked about in the surah. Wailu lil mutaffifin is how it started, right? Woe to the defrauders. So you see someone doing some kind of fraud. Philosophically, if you think about it, it links directly to their belief in the afterlife. The person does not care because they think they will not be held to account. It's a direct link. And when we are going to be, you know, when we're presented with a choice like that, we have to be very, very careful because that is where our belief is being tested in real life. So that's the fate of those who defraud others. But there are other people who don't defraud others. And sometimes that means, you know, you might have to sacrifice your own money or your own time or perhaps your own comfort. And what do you get for that sacrifice? Kalla, inna kitab al-abrari lafi illiyin. But no, the virtuous are certainly bound for illiyun. Now, this is very high, elevated, very elevated place. And really, what do you know? What will make you realize what illiyun is? Kitabu marqum, a fate already sealed. And again, the same thing applies to the records. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those souls who go with that kind of a record. Yashhaduhul muqarrabun, witnessed by those nearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This could mean the angels. And angels also have ranks. So there are angels who are in this world doing things. There are angels who are higher. And then there are angels who are very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could mean those angels. It could also mean the muqarribin that are uh, that are mentioned as as sabiqun people who are really close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could also mean those. Allah knows best. Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. And then the story continues about what happens after the Day of Judgment. That surely the virtuous will be in bliss. Uh, be seated on couches uh, looking around. If you look at their face, you will recognize the glow of delight. They will be given a drink of sealed, it says pure wine. Yeah, okay, fine, we can call it pure wine, but it's like a drink. It's a beautiful drink. Uh, whose last sip will smell like musk. 
So let whoever, وفي ذلك فليتنافس المتنافسون. So let whoever aspires to this strive diligently. Okay. So that's a that's a translation. Uh, that's that's a you know it's a mouthful. But really, what's being talked about here is being ambitious. There are some people among you who will feel that you are ambitious. You want to do something. You want to compete. You're competitive. I know I am certainly like that, and many other people might be. And then our level of competitiveness will vary. This is another one of those human instincts. But Allah SWT is saying, not denying your instincts, but this is what you should be competitive in. This is what you should be striving for. وَفِي ذَلِكَ In this, فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ You want to compete? Compete in this. Compete in becoming among the عليون. Compete in being witnessed by the muqarrabun. Compete in getting that bliss, which is mentioned here in al abrar al This is what is worth competing. Really, what else would be worth it? وَمِزَاجُهُ min tasneem. And this drink's flavor will come from tasneem. عَيْنًا يَشْرَبُ بِهَا الْمُقَرَّبُونَ A spring from which those nearest to Allah will drink. Allah knows best what this is, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing it in His own words, in the Qur'an. I'm sure it's really good. Uh, and we will not fully understand or appreciate what that is. But uh, may Allah subhanahu wa make us among those who will drink from tasneem. Ameen. Say Ameen. Now, all of the sacrifices and the difficulties that we had in this world, they come with some, um, some advantages that we just talked about. And also, all the difficulties that we go in this world include how we are treated by other human beings around us. So, Allah SWT is also talking about that. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أَجْرَمُوا كَانُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَضْحَكُونَ Indeed, the wicked used to laugh at the believers. It is all witnessed by God. All these things that happen, they're all witnessed by God. All the difficulties that we go through, they're all witnessed by God. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِهِمْ يَتَغَامَزُونَ They wink to one another whenever they pass by. You know, like, uh, here comes the, here comes the, you know, the, the really good guy, or he comes a really good Muslim, you know, you know, moving their eyes like that. And these same people who used to wink at each other, they they muse over the exploits upon returning to their own uh, families. And this say in the, here it says with their own people. Literally, the word is ahlihim. They they go back to their homes, they go back to their families, and they call you know, uh, uh, kind of saying that. Today I did this, and today I did that. Today I saw that guy. This is what I said to him. And, you know, we have these people, and they're just useless people. Because they still have a close relationship with their families, but they do not recognize the nobility needed to rise above the life of this world. And when they saw the faithful, they would say, these people are truly astray. Even though they were not sent as keepers over the believers, it's not, I mean, it's not their job to start uh, labeling people like that. But on that day, the believers will be laughing at the disbelievers. Uh, it's self-explanatory. As they sit on canopied couches looking on. The believers will be asked, have the disbelievers not been paid back for what they used to do? This is self-explanatory. If you have any questions, I'll answer them quickly. But this was Surah Al-Mutaffifin. I'm just going to make a quick link between the beginning of this surah and how the surah ended. In the beginning, Allah SWT was talking about people who defraud other people. Fraud happens as a direct link to disbelief. People who do not believe really, in the accountability of the afterlife properly, are the ones who defraud other people. And if it's a Muslim who's defrauding other people, then at that moment, they're not really fully recognizing how they will be held to account. Either because they have just ignored it, or it could be because they think they'll be treated specially. Of course, they will not be treated specially, so better be careful. And then, in the end of the surah, Allah SWT is talking about in ladina ajramu, the people who were uh, criminals. That's the word that's being used here. Like the word jurb we use in our own language as well. These are the people who used to commit crimes. And the crime here that's being talked about is laughing at the people who are trying to do the right thing. These are the people who do not defraud other people. 
These are the people who make better choices. But Allah SWT is talking about the difficulties that the, uh, that the, that the people of Allah SWT went through in this world and how on the Day of Judgment it will all be balanced out. And that brings us to the homework for today. Uh, first of all, uh, listen to the recitation of al mutaffifin and this time it is in the Qalun recitation. So like Warsh, Qalun is another another qira'ah, and I want you to go through this, and I, my, my request, try to memorize this surah. The last thing that I want to do before we leave today is we need to figure out the timings that we're going to use for Ramadan, and the way we're going to do this is I'm going to run a poll. Uh, I've already asked a few people, our volunteers help me out, and we ended up with two time slots that will work better during Ramadan. So one time slot is about an hour earlier, so 4 to 4.30 p.m. The second time slot is in the morning after Fajr. So that'll be 6 to 6.30 a.m. These are two time slots. So the way I'm going to do this is I will turn on a poll and I want you guys to respond to this poll. It's just been launched to go ahead and pick the time slot that is uh, your preferred time slot. And that way we will uh, we will go with that, inshallah. So there's 4 to 4.30 p.m. That's in the evening, but about an hour earlier. And 6 a.m. to 6.30 a.m., which is early in the morning. And I recognize the time for Fajr is different yeah, and we have people from different countries joining as well. So obviously that will uh, affect um, uh, the, the choice that you make. I will let you guys go through this. And when you're done, inshallah, we will then make a decision based on whatever the majority wants. Okay. Um, still, I think some people are still responding. Okay, so everyone's responded. Everyone uh, we have thus far at least has responded. So I will share the results here. You guys can see the results. Oh, you didn't see the poll? Okay. Um, it is supposed to show up on, uh, on your screen, actually. But if you have not uh, seen it, can you just, just type in whatever your preferred timings are? 4 to 4.30 a.m. or, uh, uh, sorry, 4 to 4.30 p.m. or... 6 to 6 30 a.m so evening or morning just go ahead and it will include yours as well okay so it looks very even between the two uh 4 to 4 30 p.m okay so that that uh helps us uh get one over uh, so the majority say 4 to 4 30 p.m so we will inshallah next week uh, uh, do this at 4 to 4 30 p.m and let's say if you know people discover it's a big problem then the subsequent week we we may consider changing it inshallah in the meanwhile our uh, volunteer isa inshallah will share the homework with you guys and i want to wish you guys a blessed ramadan the first 10 days please make sure you make lots of dua for forgiveness uh, the the dua that is narrated from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam oh allah uh, you are you love to forgive so please uh, forgive us. So please remember to make this dua. And inshallah, I will see you guys next uh, Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m. Assalamu alaikum wa